Good morning. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. Asian stocks are off to a strong start after US stocks gained the most in eight months and the dollar fell. And that's all because Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that the interest rates are just below neutral, signaling a pos possible pause in rate hikes in 2019. The new backdated data series fixes earlier anomalies, says Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar as the debate over GDP data rages on. Bloomberg has reported that Unilever has pipped Nestle to the post in the race for GSK's India Consumer Union, Unit. And debt-laden ILNFS will invite expressions of interest for the renewable uh, energy for its renewable energy assets as part of its asset sale plan. Let's talk about the U.S. markets and uh, they were clearly buzzing yesterday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average surged more than 600 points on Wednesday, erasing its November tumble. That's after Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell eased investor worries about an aggressive increase in the interest rates in 2019. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News tells you everything that happened in that Wall Street session. U.S. stocks surged across the board in the latest session on Wall Street on speculation that the Federal Reserve has turned more dovish. We saw the Dow add 300 plus points for a gain of two and a half percent. The Nasdaq gained almost three percent. Add tech and software stocks. Many of the stocks that led the way lower in the past six weeks led the big rally. It was the biggest gain for U.S. stocks in eight months. We also saw the dollar fall from near record levels and gold catch a bid. The catalyst for all this were the comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell at a New York economic forum that fueled speculation the central bank is closer than thought to putting a pause on its plan to raise interest rates. Meanwhile, on the economic front, a report showed a surprise slowdown in U.S. home sales. October new home sales fell to the slowest rate since March 2016. Higher mortgage rates and higher home prices are to blame. In oil trading, we saw West Texas Intermediate fall almost 2.5%, near $50, as a surprisingly large gain in U.S. oil supplies added to concern about a global supply glut. In New York, Sue Keenan, Bloomberg News. Well, let's talk about that big update from uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman. Jerome Powell cast a bright picture of the U.S. economy and suggested that the Fed might consider a pause in its interest rate hikes next year to assess the impact of its credit tightening. The Fed used its first ever financial stability report to warn primarily of the dangers lurking in corporate debt as it made the case that the banks it regulates are strongly capitalized. Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes sums up all the details in this report. So when you have Fed officials start saying, well, you know, we want to be just above the neutral rate, and now they're saying, well, we're uncertain about the neutral rate, I think that's why it's catching so much attention, because ultimately, where the Fed believes the neutral rate is will have a lot to do with where they stop with their interest rate increases. And it seems to me this uncertainty now over where the neutral rate is, and there's a wide range of views on the FOMC, is really kind of at the heart of the Fed debate. And remember, last month, and it's true, it was kind of an off-the-cuff uh, remark to Judy Woodruff by Jay Powell, he said the Fed was still a long way to go from neutral, but this is what he said, probably in a little more measured, thoughtful way today. Interest rates are still low by historical standards, and they remain just below the range of estimates of that level that would be neutral for the economy, that is neither speeding up nor slowing down growth just below the neutral rate. And this is so interesting. This was a speech about financial stability because the Fed released its first semi-annual financial stability report today, the vast majority of his remarks. But he did start off putting this comment in about how, how the economy still looks good, inflation still about where it needs to be, and then this just below neutral rate. Now, another thing that's important here is that Powell also echoed something that Rich Clarida said yesterday. He's the Fed vice chair in that job just two months, saying that the Fed's not on a preset course. To me, this t speaks to this sense, well, gee, if the Fed is looking for three rate hikes in 2019, this is a preset course. But the Fed doesn't view it that way because they're always assessing the data. Rich Clarida said they're not just assessing the data for to figure out, gee, what do we do with the next 
meeting, they're assessing the data to know, again, where's the neutral rate? Because it can change, it can get higher, it can get lower. Uh, I think it's interesting um, that Mike Ferroli over at JP Morgan was writing about this and he said, look, the range right now for the neutral rate is two and a half to three percent. At the end of the year, the Fed with one rate hike will be up around two and a half percent. Right. So if you're at that end of the range, you've hiked just about enough. If you think that the neutral rate's at three and a half percent, you're in the camp, maybe it thinks there's a lot more to go. I think we're all learning a lot more about neutral rate than we ever intended to, but obviously it's a big focus for the Fed. Well, it might just turn out to be uh, a positive uh, cue for the markets. It has, in fact, uh, today but we'll have to see how long that pans out. Uh, clearly, the Asian stocks are also reacting positively. To find out exactly what's happening in those markets, let's go straight across to Sophie Kamruddin of Bloomberg News, who's joining us live from the Hong Kong studios. Uh, Sophie, uh, a lot of green that I can see in the markets today. How's it looking on the ground there? Yes, a positive cue indeed from Jerome Powell's speech. So it is risk on for Asian market markets with stocks set for a fourth day of gains. And regional currencies are finding support as well from the dollar's overnight retreat. Powell's dovish tone sparked the biggest drop in two weeks for the greenback. And as focus now shifts toward the trump Xi meeting in Buenos Aires on Saturday, currency traders are anticipating volatility ahead as investors brace for another round of tariffs. Now in equity markets today, the KOSPI is rising ahead of Friday's likely rate high from the Bank of Korea. Japanese stocks are climbing for a fifth straight session, but consumer staples are losing ground despite the beat in retail sales for October. And over in Sydney, tech and materials are leading the rise. And here in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng is adding to its best monthly gains since January. And stocks in Shanghai are set to extend gains for a third straight day. Back to you. Thanks so much for that, Sophie. Well, let's turn to India now. And clearly, you can't ask for better cues. Uh, Darshan Mehta is here to tell you all about uh, the trade setup for the day in India and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Darshan, clearly markets are buzzing. Good setup for today. Yeah, it is extremely good uh, because the SCX50 is indicating a positive cue. Global cues are doing well. Asian markets are doing well. Crude, in fact, was down 2.5% uh, overnight trade. Uh, metals on the LME started to rebound. So uh, I think stars are aligning for a decent run today. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the SCX50. 10,800 is something that probably we will see. These are the future rates so probably uh, with uh, expiry today we will uh, open up uh, close to this level only so that's uh, the trend that we're seeing in as far as the SX nifty is concerned now how did the ADR span out in trade most of them did well look at how Infosys has rallied it rallied up almost six percent in trade HDFC Bank uh, ICICI Bank also managed to rally close to three percent Wipro was up almost 1.6 percent so across the board uh, positive cues coming in the only exception was Tata Motors which was down almost 1.2 percent but apart from it uh, ADRs did manage to do well in trade now, how did uh, uh, the sectors pan out in trade? The, while the Nifty went up by almost 43 points, courtesy of some in stocks, there was selling pressure that was seen on the mid cap and the small cap end of the market. Let's see how uh, the PSU banking index and the banking index panned out in trade. So it was only the Nifty that rallied in trade, while there was pain in the other sectors as far as the market was concerned. To one of to a couple of sectors that we want to highlight again, media sector was up almost two percent, courtesy of uh, Z Entertainment moving in trade, and the sector that probably didn't do well was the metal sector again sell-off coming in uh, it was down almost one percent in trade now if you're looking at the fund flows FIS bought in 960 crores DIs were net sellers to the tune of 330 crores uh, if you're looking at what contributed to the move in nifty which moved up 40 points basically it was the heavyweights that uh, contributed TCS Infosys Reliance HDFC Bank the four large uh, caps uh, on the nifty contributed uh, while on the negative side you had uh, yes bank LNT ITC and Bharti Airtel so it was only because of a select few stocks that you saw a rally as far as the nifty is concerned apart from it it was rather weak in trade but things will change today because of the SGX nifty how it's panned out in trade how did the commodities pack pan out in trade again you saw that you're seeing that uh, uh, crude is uh, up in today's trade but remember uh, it's up one percent in trade currently but remember overnight was down two and a half percent in trade so there is still uh, Brent is still below the sixty dollar barrel per mark in trade how did the base metal span out on the enemy again strong cues coming in most of the base metal except for tin uh, which was down which was flat in trade saw a little bit of rally that came in copper was up almost 1.2 percent even if you're looking in China currently uh, it, it's it's a sea of green currently copper is up one and a half percent you can see steel rebar rebounding to over one percent in trade so our traction on the commodity side across the board has been strong uh, we are in terms of uh, we are in the expiry day today uh, rollovers have been decent 48 uh, percent rollovers this two on the long side we think that nifty managed to end up the bank nifty rollovers let's pull that up and 
currency, what they're doing, that was up close to 40%. The Bank Nifty ended flat in trade. How are we positioned for trade today and how can we expect expiry? We are seeing that there is a lot of uh, put writing from levels of 10,500 to 10,700 and call writers from 10,700 to 10,800. Now, since uh, the Nifty rallied yesterday, and it rallied today. Let's see what happened yesterday. Again, you saw put writers be active at 10,700. What you will see today because of this 100 point up move is the fact that call writers will shed position and at these level and these put writers will start again writing in trade and that probably will move on to the next series. So positive cues coming in and that's the trend that we are seeing in on the FNO side. Apart from it, uh, the stocks that are in the FNO band, there is Adani Enterprises, Adani Power and uh, Jet Airways uh, are in the FNO band. Uh, what, uh, uh, what comes what goes out of the FNO band is uh, is Devan housing in in trade. Now, if you're looking at uh, some of the traction uh, in trade, uh, the Nifty piece, Nifty moved up, PCR moved up to 1.81 from 1.74, and the Bank Nifty PCR moved up to 1.26 from 1.37. So that came down slightly. Uh, stocks in focus. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening. Again, high open interest build up was seen in Kerala Healthcare. Fresh short positions were seen. Oil India saw fresh short positions. Have also that's what we are saying that apart from the Nifty, there was a pain as far as the mid cap end of the market is concerned and in terms of stocks we saw unwinding that came in again uh, united breweries uh, saw long uh, saw long unwinding uh, short covering was seen in pvr as well as kpit all right thanks so much for that darshan well, uh, let's talk about another big update from last evening. Uh, this one from back home. The government has released the official back data for GDP growth measured by the new 2011-12 series. Now, the new set of economic data revises India's growth rate lower between 2006 and 2012 compared to that recorded by the 2004-2005 series. Bloomberg Quinn's Ira Dugal caught up with Rajiv Kumar, the vice chairman of the Niti Aayog, to find out the think tank's methodology and the rationale behind the new series. Listen in. The direction is still the same. Uh, you know, the, uh, the back series down release this time uh, have uh, generally level uh, increase the level of the GDP at constant prices so that, you know, uh, you can see that there is an increase in the level of the activity. Uh, but uh, but the growth rate uh, has tended to come down because you can't keep both uh, you know you can't have both uh, you know sort of growing at the same rate uh, so so I think uh, uh, the, the the new data that has been now released has uh, you know has been uh, estimated by much superior methodology has had a much larger data source the data coverage is much better and now it's much in much more in sync with the system of national accounts of UN 2008 and therefore it makes our data far more globally comparable than what the earlier series was so i think uh, uh, you know uh, I, we can go into the details of how all the data coverage that i've talked to you of methodology is much much better but uh, let me assure you that this has been vetted very seriously and very rigorously by some of the some of the country's best statistical minds and experts uh, for which the Niti Aayog had arranged uh, two round tables you know on which this data was discussed and we took the trouble uh, to make sure over a period of a month uh, that what you what 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 the uh, what's put out is is, is rigorously uh, as uh, as good and, uh, and and methodologically as robust as as is possible let me ask you about the methodology a little bit more, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, so you're saying this was vetted by a series of experts. Uh, firstly, you know, over what period of time, how many suggestions were taken on board on the methodology to be used before arriving on this one? And why was there such a difference in the methods used by the National Statistical Commission uh, and uh, the, this particular set of numbers where it's been put out by the CSO, although fronted by the Niti Aayog? The last question first, uh, one that both Niti Aayog and CSO are part of the same government, I hope, I, 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 you, you will accept. And that I told you that Niti Aayog uh, had arranged for, you know, all the expert, uh, uh, all the expert um, uh, consultations uh, and the vetting of the data. And three, that Niti Aayog is a technically competent, robust body. So the point that being made, very, I have heard it on the other channels as to why Niti Aayog and not CSO, 
Niti Aayog and CSO work very closely uh, in, in tandem with each other. At one point of time, you would remember, uh, MOSPI used to be, uh, you know, in some sense organically connected to the uh, to the Niti Aayog or its predecessor. So that question is a bit, uh, you know, sort of, I, I doubt, I don't think that question is a really valid one. On the second one about how my, how far the consultations were done, the back series has taken more than two and a half years uh, to be prepared. There have been several, several iterations. Uh, the former chief institution, uh, Dr. T. C. Anand, who started this process and was one of the people who have been overseeing it, was one of the people among the ten who had also been consulted to vet its rigor and its methodology, and he would, he would vouch for the fact there had been a large number of suggestions that have been done both by national and international experts to make sure that this data, this series, is much more in sync with the globally accepted <coughs> norms that you've had. And third, the, the third th th thing that you said about the National Statistics Commission, uh, they, they made a much far more simplistic uh, uh, exercise, made some dramatic, drastic uh, assumptions and came up, and I, I give you a very specific thing, that for the year 11-12, which is the base year for the new series, and the end point of the earlier, what they did was to estimate the GDP level at the two, with the 2004-05 as base, and also with 2011-12 as base, saw that there was a three lakh crore difference between the two levels and distributed that level over the previous you know five six over the years until 2004-5 to you know on the assumption that growth rates don't generally change very much and they could therefore you know distribute it in some sense in equal measure over the previous years now this is this is, they, they done it you should ask them about how they did it but what the CSO has done this time on this occasion is really to completely recalibrate economic activity in the country for the previous years by using, I mean, giving you one example, uh, you know, earlier they were, people were using the ASI data, a very small segment of, you know, in the corporations or companies that you had, the new series uses 500,000 uh, company data released by the Ministry of Company Affairs. And I can go on and on on right. this. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you as to why, uh, again an example, using sector-specific price indices yeah. rather than just an aggregate price indices, uh, you know, to be able to deflate the data. There are a large number of improvements that the new series have done over the previous one. All right, and you can read all the details of that uh, story and that update on the website, BloombergQueen.com, it's all there. But uh, on to another big update in the mergers and acquisitions space this time. Unilever has pipped Nestle to the post in the race for Indian consumer health business of a GSK. Sources have told Bloom, uh, Bloomberg uh, that Unilever has offered to pay $3 billion for 70% of the business that also owns the popular malted milk brand Horlicks. People in the know have also said that Nestle has dropped out of the race. Representatives from all the involved parties declined to comment. The deal would mark Unilever's biggest strategic move after it sold its underperforming spreads business this year. I'm joined now by Yashupadhyay, who has all the stocks that you have to watch out for in trade today on account of them being in the news. Good morning, Yash. What's on your list today? Morning, uh, morning, Alex. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about Sickle Logistics and a big order win coming in for the company uh, after they reported to the exchanges post market as that they have won a big 363 crore rupees order uh, spanning over a period of three years. Uh, Cosmos Films would be in focus as well after the company said that it has decided to postpone uh, the delivery and commissioning of its new BOPT uh, production line by eight to ten quarters. Now that is a big negative, so it could come under some pressure in today's day of trade. Positive news flow continues as far as Indoco Remedies is concerned uh, after the company said that it has commissioned its new API manufacturing facility in Ma in Maharashtra. Now, this new facility will enhance its ex existing uh, uh, existing capacity by almost four folds, going from 150 uh, tons per annum to 600 tons per annum. So, watch out for that. TCS will also be in focus after the company uh, acquired a stake in US-based consulting firm Bridgepoint. And in a separate announcement that came just a few hours back, uh, the company has also 
received uh, a clean chit from the from the California jury in terms of claims over favoring Indian workers as against uh, the American workers in uh, the United States. Vakrangi, uh, that one has too received a clean chit from SEBI uh, for uh, for uh, for claims of uh, stock price manipulation. However, uh, there were uh, reported uh, uh, discrepancies when it came to promoter shareholding and the and the market regulator has warned them with that. Uh, in, as far as the key buddies are concerned, Shankara Building Products would be in focus, wherein Amansa Holdings has acquired close to 3 lakh shares, or about 1.28% stake in the company. All right, thanks so much for that, Yash. Samit Sarkar is joining me now with the big brokerage calls of the day. Uh, Samit, what do you have for us? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Alex. And the big brokerage calls for the day first we have is Macquarie on Tata Steel. Now, the brokerage has maintained its outperform rating on the stock with a target price of around 730 for Tata Steel. Now, in an analyst meet, Tata Steel said that they are looking to grow only in the Indian market with an aim to reach 30 million tons per annum capacity by 2025. And it also said that the Kalinganagar Phase 2 expansion and Bhushan Steel would significant, significantly improve the company's product mix, which will lead to cost efficiencies and drive the margin expansion for the company going forward. Now, the company also said that they are not keen to match the higher bid of JSW Steel for Bushin Power Asset, which means that there won't be any price wars and their ultimate focus remains on deleveraging Tata Steel and not in any price wars. So that is a big positive announcement that the company has said. Lastly, Tata Steel also confirmed that, the, that they have, there has been a correction uh, in the China steel prices, which have put domestic steel prices under pressure. However, the impact on this, on, on of this correction in steel prices on the company would be limited due to its contract seals with auto companies and because of its value added products in their portfolio. Now, second we have is HSBC on the oil marketing companies. Now, according to the brokerage with a fall in oil prices, not only the margins for the oil marketing companies will normalize sooner, but the chances of policy risk have also reduced on this oil marketing company. And the brokerage also expecting the company's refining business to remain the engine of growth in 2019 and in 2020 because of the IMO 2020 regulations that will kick in. Lastly, it also sees that despite this fall in crude prices, investor confidence has been lower on oil marketing companies, which should gradually improve going forward in the coming months as it is expecting government to manage oil prices with changing uh, through changes in taxes and not through changes in uh, retail prices. Now, for all the three oil marketing companies, they have maintained their buy rating but have marginally increased the target price. For Indian Oil Corporation, they have increased the target price to 176 from 174 rupees. For BPCL, they have increased the target price to 392 rupees from 360. And for HPCL, they have increased the target price to 300 from 260 rupees. All right. Thanks so much for that, Samit. Now, on to elections updates. Uh, polling for all 230 seats in Madhya Pradesh concluded last evening with 75% of the voters exercising their franchise. The number is higher than the 72.69% turnout recorded in 2013. A voter turn turnout of close to 80% was also recorded in the three Naxal-affected seats where polling commenced an hour before schedule and ended at 3 p.m. Reports say that three government employees uh, on poll duty died of cardiac arrest, though. On the other hand, the fate of 209 candidates uh, was sealed by 80% voters in northeastern state of uh, Mizoram. Polling took place for all 40 seats. The voter turnout, however, was less than the 82% recorded in the 2013 election. Now, global leaders will gather in the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires, uh, this week for the Group of 20 summit. While leaders will try to build consensus on key issues, the talks will be overshadowed by trade tensions between the United States and China. Here's a breakdown of what to expect from that two-day summit taking place uh, tomorrow and day after. It's called reciprocal. We have to have reciprocal trade. We can't have trade that's meant for uh, stupid people. What we witnessed this weekend is yet another reckless Russian escalation. And with permission, I would like to make a statement on the conclusion of our negotiations. I can say to the House with absolute certainty that there is not a better deal available. And my fellow leaders...
Now, if I handed you one million dollars in cash today, I'm not saying I will, but what are the possible options you would consider for investments? Would you consider investments or would you blow it up like a rock star? Here's uh, a couple of experts who will tell you exactly what you should do. Take a look. Those are all out of the way options uh, here at Bloomberg Quint on Ask BQ. You can find out all about stocks to invest in and on portfolio, we tell you all about how to manage your finances to achieve all your financial goals. So write in to us and we'll help you out. This is Bloomberg Quint. It's not about the award. It never is. It's about what went before and what came after.